John and Emily Cooper had been happily married for over 10 years. The two high school sweethearts wed shortly after college and settled down in their suburban hometown to start a family. John worked as an accountant at a local firm, while Emily taught elementary school. John and Emily were thrilled when their son Michael was born. At age eight, Michael was a smart, kind-hearted boy who loved playing sports. He was the center of his parents' world. The family lived in a cozy house with a big backyard perfect for Michael's games. They also had a loyal golden retriever named Bailey who watched over Michael. The Coopers made it a priority to eat dinner together each night and spend quality time as a family on weekends. Whether playing board games or watching a movie, John treasured these moments. He felt lucky to have both a successful career and a loving family. John and Emily's relationship remained strong thanks to open communication, trust, and intimacy. From the outside, the Cooper seemed to have an ideal life free of any major problems. John felt incredibly blessed to have such a devoted wife and a healthy, happy child. He believed Emily felt the same way. They were best friends as much as spouses. John had no idea just how soon everything he cherished would come crashing down. But for now, John was satisfied. He couldn't imagine anything disrupting their harmony. The Cooper's home was filled with laughter and love. John thanked God daily for the life they had built together. Little did he know how much was hidden underneath the surface of their family. John and Emily's greatest joy was their son Michael. At age eight, Michael was a bundle of energy who kept his parents smiling. He had Emily's bright blue eyes and John's unruly dark hair. Michael was smart as a whip and did well in school. Michael loved reading, though his favorite books were far more adventurous than the classics John recalled from boyhood. Emily often found Michael lost in tales of wizards, robots, and outer space. Michael wrote his own short stories too, filled with monsters and action heroes. Emily proudly displayed his work on the refrigerator. On weekends, John helped coach Michael's soccer team. Though one of the smaller kids, Michael made up for it with speed and agility. He relished sliding in the grass to steal the ball. After games, Michael recounted each play to John on the car ride home. John lived for Saturdays, spent cheering Michael on from the sidelines. Back at home, Playtime with Bailey was another of Michael's favorite activities. He'd throw a ball for the eager dog to fetch for hours. At night, Michael would curl up with Bailey by his bedside as John read them stories. Bailey was Michael's protector and faithful companion. To John, Michael was a daily reminder of the marriage he and Emily had built. Seeing Michael smile each morning gave John purpose. The Cooper household revolved around taking care of Michael's needs, supporting his growth, and making sure he felt safe, loved, and happy. He was the shining light that made John's life full. From the outside looking in, it seemed the Coopers had an ideal life. John and Emily were high school sweethearts who had made their relationship last. Michael was a bright, active boy any parent would be proud of. The family home was cozy and welcoming. John felt incredibly grateful for the family and life he shared with Emily and Michael. Waking up each morning with Emily by his side, knowing Michael was sound asleep down the hall, filled John's heart with contentment. He valued their quiet moments together over dinners, playing in the yard, or cuddling up to watch TV. John often thought about how lucky he was compared to some of his childhood friends who came from broken homes. Emily was his rock and he trusted her completely. He believed she felt the same way about him. They still made time for romantic date nights while John's parents babysat Michael. They laughed often. There seemed like a model marriage. While John had to work long hours at times, he derived satisfaction from providing Emily and Michael a comfortable life. He felt proud when he attended Michael's sports games and school events. The Cooper family enjoyed summer beach vacations and camping trips together. They attended church each Sunday as a family. Most days when John left for work, he looked forward to coming home to Emily and Michael's cheerful greetings at day's end. 
he considered himself fortunate to have both a fulfilling career and family life. He couldn't imagine anything disrupting the happiness they had built. To John, this was everything a man could hope for. The first hints of trouble arose gradually. Emily began coming home later from school in the evenings. She told John she was just busy grading papers or planning lessons with colleagues. He didn't question it at first, but her late nights steadily increased. When John attempted to discuss his day over dinner, Emily seemed distant and distracted. She responded with one-word answers while staring down at her phone. John found himself eating alone most nights while Emily worked in the other room. He missed their lively conversations. Rather than lounging together watching TV after Michael went to bed, Emily now pleaded exhaustion and retreated to read a book or take a bath. She declined John's subtle romantic overtures. John felt puzzled by this change in his wife, who once craved his affection. Emily's mood grew more sullen and irritable. She snapped at John over minor things like a dirty dish left in the sink. Emily had always been meticulous, but now she nitpicked endlessly. John found himself walking on eggshells to avoid setting her off. He didn't understand what was happening. A distance grew between John and Emily that left John concerned. She acted like everything was fine, but her actions revealed otherwise. He wanted to believe work was truly keeping Emily preoccupied. However, late at night while lying awake, John couldn't ignore the uneasy feeling taking root inside him. Around the same time, she grew more distant. Emily also began working later hours. She taught elementary school and was usually home by 4 p.m. But suddenly Emily told John she needed to grade papers or meet with students' parents after school. At first, it was just a couple days a week. But soon Emily was getting home at 6 or 7 p.m. nearly every weekday. She said her students needed extra help prepping for standardized tests. When John asked if she could delegate some tasks to fellow teachers, Emily insisted it was her responsibility. Emily claimed her late nights were temporary. She said this batch of students needed some extra attention and she wanted them to succeed. John tried being understanding, though he grew lonely without her evening companionship. He missed having dinner ready when she got home. The late hours put extra pressure on John. He now had to pick Michael up from school and get him started on homework by himself. There were no more family dinners. John had to handle bedtime routine solo too. He felt like a single parent. When John brought up his concerns, Emily deflected them. She said this was an unusually needy class and that things would go back to normal soon. But her late arrivals became the new norm. John started to suspect Emily wasn't telling him the full truth about where she was those nights. One evening, John accidentally discovered the real reason for Emily's late nights. While using her phone to look up a restaurant's menu, he noticed she had left open a messaging window. John saw flirtatious texts exchanged with a contact named Brian. Reading through their conversation, it became clear Brian was someone Emily worked with. They were planning a secret rendezvous that weekend while John took Michael on an overnight camping trip. The intimate tone made it obvious this was an affair. John's hands shook as he took screenshots of the incriminating messages. Phrases like, I've missed you so much, and I can't stop thinking about your touch, left no doubt about the true nature of Emily's relationship with this other man. John felt sick to his stomach. Part of John didn't want to believe what he was seeing. But the evidence was undeniable. All the late nights now had a very different explanation. Emily was betraying their marriage vows. John's shock quickly turned to anger, hurt, and humiliation. After ten years of devotion, John was crushed to realize Emily willingly destroyed their bond of trust. He had sacrificed so much to provide her a comfortable life and thought she felt fulfilled. Discovering her cheating left John questioning everything he thought he knew about their life together. The investigator discovered that Emily had racked up over $50,000 in credit card debt unknown to John. She spent lavishly on clothes, electronics, and luxury goods on a monthly basis. 
Bank statements revealed Emily was addicted to reckless shopping sprees. John pretended not to know anything when Emily came to pick up Michael for visitation. But inside, John swelled with anticipation about the valuable evidence Frank was gathering through diligent surveillance on his wayward wife. Soon John would have ample ammunition for the legal fight ahead. After a few weeks of close surveillance, the private investigator Frank reported some very concerning findings to John about Emily's behavior. It turned out her affair was just the tip of the iceberg. Emily had been hiding major financial issues from John. The investigator discovered that Emily had racked up over $50,000 in credit card debt unknown to John. She spent lavishly on clothes, electronics, and luxury goods on a monthly basis. Bank statements revealed Emily was addicted to reckless shopping sprees. Frank came highly recommended for domestic cases involving infidelity and hidden assets. His background as a former police detective made John feel confident in Frank's abilities. For a sizable fee, Frank agreed to trail Emily wherever she went and document anything suspicious. At first, the investigator's reports back to John were fairly mundane. Emily went to work, the gym, the grocery store, nothing out of the ordinary, but John told Frank to stay vigilant. If Emily had hidden an affair so well, she was likely covering other things too. Sure enough, within a couple weeks, Frank uncovered Emily making large cash withdrawals from ATMs around town. She also frequented a local casino and flirted openly with other men there. Emily was careless about hiding her activities from the watchful private eye. John decided he needed to investigate quietly to uncover the full truth. He knew if he confronted Emily directly, she would just deny everything. But if John kept digging, he suspected he would find more incriminating information. While the affair alone provided adequate grounds for divorce, John's gut told him there were more secrets to uncover. He needed to know everything before the custody battle began. John hoped shining a light on whatever Emily was hiding would strengthen his court case. To dig deeper into Emily's life, John hired a private investigator named Frank. John explained his suspicions about Emily's sudden change in behavior and secretive nature. He wanted Frank to follow Emily discreetly and report back. John braced himself for a brutal legal fight, but his priority was protecting Michael. He knew Emily would resist losing custody, but John was determined to show the court he could provide Michael the stable home life Emily had rejected. Whatever it took, John vowed to put his son's needs first. After agreeing to divorce, John began having nagging suspicions there was more to Emily's story. Her explanation for the affair didn't sit right with him. John wondered what else Emily might be hiding. John knew how meticulous Emily was about finances and parenting. Her reckless behavior seemed totally out of character. He started to think her motivations involved more than just feeling neglected or wanting passion. Emily had always been an open book with John before. Now it felt like she had pulled down an iron curtain and hidden major parts of her life. John racked his brain trying to figure out what Emily might be covering up. Though deeply hurt by Emily's request for divorce, John knew there was no use fighting it. Her affair and indifference made repairing their marriage impossible. Reluctantly, John agreed to split up. However, his main concern became protecting his son. John worried that Emily's recklessness and selfishness could endanger Michael. He didn't want Michael shuffled back and forth between two homes. John believed stability and routine would be best for Michael's well-being. Soon after Emily moved out, John hired a sharp divorce lawyer named Susan. He explained his desire to seek full legal and physical custody of Michael. Susan said John had a strong case based on Emily's infidelity and lack of interest in parenting. At their first divorce hearing, John requested shared custody of Michael, knowing it would be unrealistic to deny Emily any access. But Susan felt they had a good chance of John being awarded primary custody, with Emily getting visitation rights. When John became angry and demanded to know how she could do this to him and Michael, 
Emily turned cold. She said Michael would get over it, and John would find someone else too. Her tone made clear she had checked out emotionally long ago. John felt utterly betrayed hearing Emily discuss dissolving their family so casually. He always envisioned growing old with one partner. Now Emily spoke about divorce like she was changing brands of laundry detergent. To John, it confirmed her selfishness. Despite his shock and anger, John reluctantly agreed to Emily's request for divorce. Her infidelity and disinterest made reconciling impossible. All that was left was to split their assets and start untangling the life they had woven together. The future John once saw was obliterated. By coming clean, Emily hoped John would be appeased. But he felt anything but appeased. John looked at her differently now, seeing Emily as a dishonest stranger rather than his loving wife. Her admissions confirmed she valued her own fulfillment over the life they'd built together. After Emily confessed to her ongoing affair, she made another shocking request. She wanted a divorce. Emily calmly told John the affair had opened her eyes to problems in their marriage. She felt they had grown apart and were no longer right for each other. Stunned, John asked how she could throw away their decade together so easily. He reminded her of their closeness in the early years of their relationship. But Emily insisted too much had changed. She told John she felt trapped and needed her freedom. John also submitted proof of Emily's serial romantic affairs, including video of her brazenly leaving hotels with various men and entertaining them at home. This pattern of instability and infidelity called her suitability as a moral role model into serious question. Surveillance footage from the casino depicted Emily's alcoholic binges and hours wasted gambling away thousands of dollars over petty card games. Susan hammered home that this addiction posed a danger to any child in Emily's care. The court was shown bank statements revealing the staggering depths of Emily's secret debts from gambling and frivolous spending. John's team argued this reckless money mismanagement demonstrated Emily's inability to properly care for and provide for Michael. Emily's two separate lives, the doting wife and mother, and the promiscuous gambler buried in debt, stunned Sean. He had been oblivious while Emily's addictive tendencies spiraled out of control. John knew this new evidence could prove vital in gaining custody and financial assets. When it came time for the custody hearing, John was well prepared thanks to the investigative evidence gathered on Emily. His lawyer Susan entered detailed financial records and photographs into evidence, laying out a compelling case against Emily's fitness as a parent. As if compulsive shopping and gambling weren't enough, Emily had also been taking out payday loans at sky-high interest rates, according to Frank. John realized his wife had created an intricate web of debts, likely to bankroll her vices. Even more concerning were Frank's reports about Emily's gambling habit. She frequented a local casino several times per week, often staying for hours. Video footage showed Emily playing blackjack, poker, and slot machines while drinking heavily she appeared to be throwing away thousands. At every step, Emily's lawyers struggled to mount a convincing defense against the weight of the evidence. Thanks to the diligent investigative work, John systematically dismantled any argument that Emily could provide a stable, nurturing environment for their son. With the mountain of evidence compiled against Emily, John's legal team made a compelling argument that she was an unfit parent to have custody of Michael. Susan painted Emily as completely reckless and selfish in her actions. John's lawyers also harped on Emily's chronic infidelity as proof of her putting personal pleasures over family priorities every time. They claimed her absence from the home and penchant for overnight affairs with strangers made her an absentee parent at best. Susan emphasized how Emily's behaviors demonstrated a staggering lack of judgment and responsibility. The drinking, gambling, and accumulation of massive debt showed she could not properly care for a child's needs, emotional or financial. That night when Emily got home, John confronted her about the texts. At first, Emily tried to deny everything. 
but when John revealed he'd read the messages between her and Brian, she crumbled. Emily admitted she'd been having an affair for several months. John was flabbergasted by her admission. He demanded to know details, how long it had been going on, where they met up, and whether Emily had feelings for this man. She answered his questions, all while sobbing about how sorry she was. John felt his heart breaking with each confession. Though Emily pleaded for forgiveness, insisting it didn't mean anything, John refused to accept her apologies. He said he could never trust her again after such a profound betrayal. Emily's unfaithfulness shattered John's perception of their marriage. In the heated conversation that followed, Emily revealed she wanted a divorce. The affair had opened her eyes to problems in their relationship, she claimed. Fuming with anger, John agreed to split. He contacted a lawyer the next day to start the divorce process. John was devastated that ten years of partnership could be tossed away so callously. But with Emily's infidelity exposed, there was no going back. All John could do was look ahead to untangling their merged lives. His priority became protecting himself and Michael as the divorce moved forward. When confronted with the evidence of her texts to Brian, Emily's first reaction was denial. She claimed Brian was just a work friend and their conversations were innocent. But John persisted, demanding complete honesty. Eventually, Emily broke down and admitted she had been cheating with her co-worker. Through teary eyes, Emily confessed she and Brian had become romantically involved over the past few months. She said it started harmlessly through chatting at school, but progressed to secretly meeting up outside of work. Emily revealed intimate details of how their fling started and became physical. Emily told John that Brian made her feel appreciated and desirable again after years of domestic routine. While she still cared for John, she couldn't resist the excitement of her taboo relationship with Brian. Emily described the thrilling rush she felt being with someone new. The more Emily revealed, the more John's heart shattered. He was profoundly hurt to know his loyal wife willingly destroyed their marriage and family for fleeting passion with another man. John pressed Emily for more information, torturing himself with the messy details of her double life. By coming clean, Emily hoped John would be appeased. But he felt anything but appeased. John looked at her differently now, seeing Emily as a dishonest stranger rather than his loving wife. Her admissions confirmed she valued her own fulfillment over the life they'd built together. After Emily confessed to her ongoing affair, she made another shocking request. She wanted a divorce. Emily calmly told John the affair had opened her eyes to problems in their marriage. She felt they had grown apart and were no longer right for each other. Stunned, John asked how she could throw away their decade together so easily. He reminded her of their closeness in the early years of their relationship. But Emily insisted too much had changed. She told John she felt trapped and needed her freedom. When John became angry and demanded to know how she could do this to him and Michael, Emily turned cold. She said Michael would get over it and John would find someone else too. Her tone made clear she had checked out emotionally long ago. John felt utterly betrayed hearing Emily discuss dissolving their family so casually. He always envisioned growing old with one partner. Now Emily spoke about divorce like she was changing brands of laundry detergent. To John, it confirmed her selfishness. Despite his shock and anger, John reluctantly agreed to Emily's request for divorce. Her infidelity and disinterest made reconciling impossible. All that was left was to split their assets and start untangling the life they had woven together. The future John once saw was obliterated. Though deeply hurt by Emily's request for divorce, John knew there was no use fighting it. Her affair and indifference made repairing their marriage impossible. Reluctantly, John agreed to split up. However, his main concern became protecting his son. John worried that Emily's recklessness and selfishness could endanger Michael. He didn't want Michael shuffled back and forth between two homes. John believed stability and routine would be best for Michael's well-being. 
Soon after Emily moved out, John hired a sharp divorce lawyer named Susan. He explained his desire to seek full legal and physical custody of Michael. Susan said John had a strong case based on Emily's infidelity and lack of interest in parenting. At their first divorce hearing, John requested shared custody of Michael, knowing it would be unrealistic to deny Emily any access, but Susan felt they had a good chance of John being awarded primary custody, with Emily getting visitation rights. John braced himself for a brutal legal fight, but his priority was protecting Michael. He knew Emily would resist losing custody, but John was determined to, to show the court he could provide Michael the stable home life Emily had rejected. Whatever it took, John vowed to put his son's needs first. After agreeing to divorce, John began having nagging suspicions there was more to Emily's story. Her explanation for the affair didn't sit right with him. John wondered what else Emily might be hiding. John knew how meticulous Emily was about finances and parenting. Her reckless behavior seemed totally out of character. He started to think her motivations involved more than just feeling neglected or wanting passion. Emily had always been an open book with John before. Now it felt like she had pulled down an iron curtain and hidden major parts of her life. John racked his brain trying to figure out what Emily might be covering up. John decided he needed to investigate quietly to uncover the full truth. He knew if he confronted Emily directly, she would just deny everything. But if John kept digging, he suspected he would find more incriminating information. While the affair alone provided adequate grounds for divorce, John's gut told him there were more secrets to uncover. He needed to know everything before the custody battle began. John hoped shining a light on whatever Emily was hiding would strengthen his court case. To dig deeper into Emily's life, John hired a private investigator named Frank. John explained his suspicions about Emily's sudden change in behavior and secretive nature. He wanted Frank to follow Emily discreetly and report back. Frank came highly recommended for domestic cases involving infidelity and hidden assets. His background as a former police detective made John feel confident in Frank's abilities. For a sizable fee, Frank agreed to trail Emily wherever she went and document anything suspicious. At first, the investigators' reports back to John were fairly mundane. Emily went to work, the gym, the grocery store, nothing out of the ordinary, but John told Frank to stay vigilant. If Emily had hidden an affair so well, she was likely covering other things too. Sure enough, within a couple weeks Frank uncovered Emily making large cash withdrawals from ATMs around town. She also frequented a local casino and flirted openly with other men there. Emily was careless about hiding her activities from the watchful private eye. John pretended not to know anything when Emily came to pick up Michael for visitation. But inside, John swelled with anticipation about the valuable evidence Frank was gathering through diligent surveillance on his wayward wife. Soon John would have ample ammunition for the legal fight ahead. After a few weeks of close surveillance, the private investigator Frank reported some very concerning findings to John about Emily's behavior. It turned out her affair was just the tip of the iceberg. Emily had been hiding major financial issues from John. The investigator discovered that Emily had racked up over $50,000 in credit card debt unknown to John. She spent lavishly on clothes, electronics, and luxury goods on a monthly basis. Bank statements revealed Emily was addicted to reckless shopping sprees. The judge stated she had serious reservations about leaving an impressionable child in Emily's care given her issues with debt, gambling, drinking, and infidelity. Emily's well-documented absences from the home and inability to provide a stable environment were cited as prime factors. In her closing arguments, Susan bluntly stated Emily's addictions, betrayals, and selfish choices rendered her fundamentally unfit to provide a stable, nurturing environment that Michael deserved. Granting a reckless, cheating mother like Emily custody would be incredibly negligent. After weeks of testimony and evidence being presented, 
the judge finally rendered her custody decision. Based on the considerable proof of Emily's reckless behavior and unfit parenting, she awarded John full legal and physical custody of their son Michael. Moreover, Susan argued that Emily's well-documented tendency toward lying, deceit, and leading a double life proved she did not have Michael's best interests at heart. How could a child trust or respect an unrepentant cheater? Emily was granted fairly liberal visitation rights so long as the visits were prearranged and could be monitored by John. But the burden was placed on Emily to prove herself a committed, trustworthy parent before any changes could be considered. While the decision was difficult due to a preference to have both parents involved, the judge said she simply could not in good conscience place Michael's well-being at risk by granting Emily any custodial rights. This was for the child's protection. Instead, Emily was granted the ability to visit with Michael, but under very strict limitations. John would have oversight in arranging the times and locations for the visitations based on his own scheduling. Emily's visits would also be supervised by a third party, though the ruling didn't go as far as terminating Emily's parental rights entirely. The judgment granted John everything he had hoped for in his fight to do what was best for Michael. After the initial shock, John felt an immense wave of relief. While the custody ruling awarded John the overwhelming victory of being Michael's primary caregiver, it did not completely sever Emily's rights as a parent. The judge determined terminating her visitation entirely would be too extreme, at least initially. The investigator discovered that Emily had racked up over $50,000 in credit card debt unknown to John. She spent lavishly on clothes, electronics, and luxury goods on a monthly basis. Bank statements revealed Emily was addicted to reckless shopping sprees. Even more concerning were Frank's reports about Emily's gambling habit. She frequented a local casino several times per week, often staying for hours. Video footage showed Emily playing blackjack, poker, and slot machines while drinking heavily she appeared to be throwing away thousands. As if compulsive shopping and gambling weren't enough, Emily had also been taking out payday loans at sky-high interest rates, according to Frank. John realized his wife had created an intricate web of debts, likely to bankroll her vices. Emily's two separate lives, the doting wife and mother, and the promiscuous gambler buried in debt, stunned Sean. He had been oblivious while Emily's addictive tendencies spiraled out of control. John knew this new evidence could prove vital in gaining custody and financial assets. When it came time for the custody hearing, John was well prepared thanks to the investigative evidence gathered on Emily. His lawyer Susan entered detailed financial records and photographs into evidence laying out a compelling case against Emily's fitness as a parent. The court was shown bank statements revealing the staggering depths of Emily's secret debts from gambling and frivolous spending. John's team argued this reckless money mismanagement demonstrated Emily's inability to properly care for and provide for Michael. Surveillance footage from the casino depicted Emily's alcoholic binges and hours wasted gambling away thousands of dollars over petty card games. Susan hammered home that this addiction posed a danger to any child in Emily's care. John also submitted proof of Emily's serial romantic affairs, including video of her brazenly leaving hotels with various men and entertaining them at home. This pattern of instability and infidelity called her suitability as a moral role model into serious question. The court allowed John to either hire a professional supervisor or to enlist one of his family members or close friends to essentially chaperone Emily's time with her son. This was due to concerns about her ability to act appropriately. John sat Michael down and explained that from now on, it would just be the two of them as a family unit. He reassured Michael that the ugly situation with Emily was not his fault whatsoever. John vowed to provide extra love and support through this transition period. For John, having a supervisor present during visits with Emily brought immense relief. He could finally relax knowing Emily's influence would be closely monitored to protect Michael's well-being until she demonstrably changed her reckless ways.
With the custody battle resolved and his rights as Michael's sole parent established, John could finally shift his focus to just being a dad again. The nasty divorce and airing of Emily's dirty laundry left emotional scars, but John was determined to power through for his son's sake. The stringent visitation restrictions clearly established Emily as the lesser party in the custody arrangement. But the ruling also provided her an opportunity to prove herself more responsible and make her case for expanded rights in the future. John made a concerted effort to spend as much quality time bonding with Michael as possible. They attended baseball games, went camping, played video games together. Any activity Michael showed interest in, John devoted himself fully. Rebuilding their strong father-son connection was paramount. At every step, Emily's lawyers struggled to mount a convincing defense against the weight of the evidence. Thanks to the diligent investigative work, John systematically dismantled any argument that Emily could provide a stable, nurturing environment for their son. With the mountain of evidence compiled against Emily, John's legal team made a compelling argument that she was an unfit parent to have custody of Michael. Susan painted Emily as completely reckless and selfish in her actions. Susan emphasized how Emily's behaviors demonstrated a staggering lack of judgment and responsibility. The drinking, gambling, and accumulation of massive debt showed she could not properly care for a child's needs, emotional or financial. John's lawyers also harped on Emily's chronic infidelity as proof of her putting personal pleasures over family priorities every time. They claimed her absence from the home and penchant for overnight affairs with strangers made her an absentee parent at best. Moreover, Susan argued that Emily's well-documented tendency toward lying, deceit, and leading a double life proved she did not have Michael's best interests at heart. How could a child trust or respect an unrepentant cheater? In her closing arguments, Susan bluntly stated Emily's addictions, betrayals, and selfish choices rendered her fundamentally unfit to provide a stable, nurturing environment that Michael deserved. Granting a reckless, cheating mother like Emily custody would be incredibly negligent. After weeks of testimony and evidence being presented, the judge finally rendered her custody decision. Based on the considerable proof of Emily's reckless behavior and unfit parenting, she awarded John full legal and physical custody of their son Michael. With patience and open communication, John helped Michael gradually adjust to their new normal. He provided ample opportunities to discuss any questions or emotions Michael had. While Michael deeply missed his mother at first, John's consistent presence and affection slowly allowed the wounds to heal. At times, the absence of Emily created logistical challenges for John as a newly single parent. But he stepped up by better managing his work schedule and reaching out to relatives for occasional childcare assistance when needed. John's commitment never wavered. The judge stated she had serious reservations about leaving an impressionable child in Emily's care given her issues with debt, gambling, drinking, and infidelity. Emily's well-documented absences from the home and inability to provide a stable environment were cited as prime factors. While the decision was difficult due to a preference to have both parents involved, the judge said she simply could not in good conscience place Michael's well-being at risk by granting Emily any custodial rights. This was for the child's protection. Emily was granted fairly liberal visitation rights, so long as the visits were prearranged and could be monitored by John. But the burden was placed on Emily to prove herself a committed, trustworthy parent before any changes could be considered. Though the ruling didn't go as far as terminating Emily's parental rights entirely, the judgment granted John everything he had hoped for in his fight to do what was best for Michael. After the initial shock, John felt an immense wave of relief. While the custody ruling awarded John the overwhelming victory of being Michael's primary caregiver, it did not completely sever Emily's rights as a parent. The judge determined terminating her visitation entirely would be too extreme, at least initially. Instead, Emily was granted the ability to visit with Michael, but under very strict limitations. 
John would have oversight in arranging the times and locations for the visitations based on his own scheduling. Emily's visits would also be supervised by a third party. The court allowed John to either hire a professional supervisor or to enlist one of his family members or close friends to essentially chaperone Emily's time with her son. This was due to concerns about her ability to act appropriately. The stringent visitation restrictions clearly established Emily as the lesser party in the custody arrangement. But the ruling also provided her an opportunity to prove herself more responsible and make her case for expanded rights in the future. For John, having a supervisor present during visits with Emily brought immense relief. He could finally relax knowing Emily's influence would be closely monitored to protect Michael's well-being until she demonstrably changed her reckless ways. With the custody battle resolved and his rights as Michael's sole parent established, John could finally shift his focus to just being a dad again. The nasty divorce and airing of Emily's dirty laundry left emotional scars, but John was determined to power through for his son's sake. John sat Michael down and explained that from now on, it would just be the two of them as a family unit. He reassured Michael that the ugly situation with Emily was not his fault whatsoever. John vowed to provide extra love and support through this transition period. John made a concerted effort to spend as much quality time bonding with Michael as possible. They attended baseball games, went camping, played video games together. Any activity Michael showed interest in, John devoted himself fully. Rebuilding their strong father-son connection was paramount. At times, the absence of Emily created logistical challenges for John as a newly single parent. But he stepped up by better managing his work schedule and reaching out to relatives for occasional childcare assistance when needed. John's commitment never wavered. With patience and open communication, John helped Michael gradually adjust to their new normal. He provided ample opportunities to discuss any questions or emotions Michael had. While Michael deeply missed his mother at first, John's consistent presence and affection slowly allowed the wounds to heal.